I like to say when you see like before and after pictures online, they're not before and after unless that person is dead, which I don't wish on anybody. That's not an after photo. That's a during photo. Sammy, I'm so happy to have you back in the flesh. In the flesh. I'm here for you. I can't believe that's such an honor. I cannot believe we've been TikTok friends since the, dare I say, pandemic, like triggered, 2020. (laughs) And now finally, it's three years later and we're having this interview in person. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I literally jet set here just for you. Oh my God, I know. I'm honored and I'm so happy to have you in the studio. You look radiant and I'm pumped for our conversation today. I feel like real pod listeners have had many intuitive eating conversations. We've gone over the basics. We've gone over, you know, I did an episode on beginning tips. I've had you on before. That first episode Mm -hmm. was amazing. So if you guys haven't checked that out, do it. And now today, Sammy and I wanted to get into some of the more like intermediate, advanced intuitive eating topics. Yes, we're ready for it to kind of address some of the most asked questions about intuitive eating, the misconceptions about intuitive eating. And I'm so excited. I do think we should give a elevator pitch of how each of us got to intuitive eating yeah, and then dive in. So kick us off, girl. Perfect. Okay. So oh, I went to college and knew I wanted to help people, but I thought, you know what? I'd rather find the magic answer to weight loss and weight loss is going to make me happy. And that kind of started me down the nutrition science path in college, super disordered eater in college, lots of restriction, lots of binging, lots of binge drinking. Fast forward to graduation day, got my bachelor's of science, went on to become a dietitian, still didn't have that magic answer of how to lose weight and just be happy and perfect. And then even became a dietitian and was like, I still hate my body and don't have the magic answer. And I was like, something, this isn't right. Mm -hmm. This isn't right. Felt a lot of imposter syndrome, felt really icky working with clients, just didn't feel right. And then I was so blessed that I had a colleague of mine who was in my dietetic internship who was an eating disorder dietitian. And she started posting about intuitive eating online. And I was like, what is this? Like, listen to your body thing? Like, tell me more. (laughs) And so read the intuitive eating book and I was like, holy shit, this is the magic answer. It's not pursuing intentional weight loss and learning how to trust yourself again instead of all of this other stuff. So by this point, I was already a practicing dietitian, had a private practice, was helping people with air quotes, weight management. Like I cringe even saying that. I know. But hey, we did the best we could at the time with what we knew. And that statement is getting me through a lot of things in life right now. We just can't look back and have like be mad at ourselves. Like we weren't as mindful, as wise. We didn't, I don't know whether it's it's our education too. Totally. Whether it's about food specifically or just like relationship with friends, family, like everything, you know, we aren't who we are now back then. And we have to give ourselves grace. And we had to go through that. Like me telling this story, look where I'm sitting today, Mm -hmm. like with you. And I get to, you know, talk all about intuitive eating and help people make peace with food in their bodies. So I had to go through that to get to this point. And so basically just did a 180 flip of my practice where I just told people like, I can't help you lose weight intentionally anymore. And it really freaked me out because I feel like dietitians are taught that like weight loss is your party trick. And like when you tell someone you're a dietitian, they're like, oh, what diet should I do? Mm-hmm. And so or they're like, how do I really lose weight? Yeah. Like, what like, is so the key? T- yeah. Tell me the, the magic, you know, answer that I was searching for. <laughs> and I was like, well, I actually have it now. And it's that it's not intentional weight loss. Weight does not equal health. Weight does not equal your worth. And so I had to do a lot of unlearning. And then just got to a place of, like most people during the pandemic, playing around on your phone, feel like you got to get TikTok. I'm like, no, not another app. Like Instagram (laughs) is enough. And then just started to see how disordered TikTok really was. And I was like, I'm going to respond to some of this and kind of share what I was learning through the process. And fast forward, we have a private practice of, you know, Find Food Freedom is a private practice. It's also obviously on social, but we support clients all over the world. We have clients in Egypt, New Zealand, Spain, of course, U.S., Canada, all over. And our mission is to help people make peace with food and their body. Love that. And that is literally, I think, one of the biggest gifts someone can have in their own life is peace with food. Yes. I think about it all the time. I'm like, if I I could wave a magic wand and just give people the like the 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 what's it called the light switch flip that I yeah. feel like I had because there's so much to life when you're not bogged down with you know these pressures and these thoughts about food in your body all the time and yeah. I th- think most people listening know my story so I won't take too long but 
I was a binge eater in college, lots of disordered eating in my past, and then discovered intuitive eating and essentially never looked back. It just made so much sense to me. I, yeah. I loved the thought of, well, are you hungry? And if you're hungry, what do you want? Like, no, what do you actually want? Not like, yeah. what does the magazine say? What does the YouTuber say? What yeah. does the calorie the label say? say yeah. yeah, like, what do you want? So shall we dive in? Let's do it. Okay. We're going to start with the most asked questions about intuitive eating. And I think the the big one people think of is just like, okay, well, what's my first step? Let's say I'm yes. in, like, what do I do today, tomorrow? Yes. So like we said, this is intermediate advanced. So like, if you want to know the 10 principles of intuitive eating, go to intuitiveeating.org and find <laughs> those principles because you can go reject the diet mentality, principle number one. But I want to get into more like nitty gritty, like when I sit down with a client, please, really what you have to do if you want to be an intuitive eater is challenge those belief systems. You have to have awareness of what do I feel about food? What is my relationship with food like? And what do I believe about body sizes? Because if you are pursuing an intuitive eating journey, you have to challenge those belief systems, specifically what diet culture upholds, that smaller bodies are better and larger bodies are bad or unhealthy. So that first step, before you even can challenge the belief systems, I would just say is bring awareness to those belief systems. And like you just very kindly reminded me, give yourself grace, whatever those belief systems are, because we were not born thinking that fat bodies are bad, right? We were not born thinking we don't deserve food. These were taught to us. But once you have awareness of your belief systems, then you can dive into intuitive eating. Following that up with another most asked question would be, in you know, is intuitive eating unhealthy and just promoting weight gain? I love this question because that's what like all these Jim jabronis on TikTok like come at me. They're like, <laughs> you're so unhealthy. You're promoting unhealthy, blah, blah, blah. No, intuitive eating is very health promoting. But the thing is, is that it ties in the psychological and the behavioral implications that most of our research leaves out, which is aka mental health and eating disorder. So when we look at intuitive eating, it yes, it's all foods fit. So that's the fun foods and the play foods and the nutrient dense foods and the air quote healthy foods. I think the big fear that comes up for people is if I do intuitive eating, I am going to just eat cake cookies, pizza, Cheetos, all day long, every day, I'm never going to stop. Mm -hmm. But the great thing is, is that we have so much research about food habituation and what happens when you have continued exposure to these foods. So intuitive eating incorporates all of those foods, and you are going to be able at one point with intuitive eating to eat the nutrient-dense foods and the fun and play foods. And you just gave me that story off air before we started that you yeah. you bought a bag of Cheetos and you're like, oh, I forgot they, they were there and then I ate them days later. Right. Who am I? I know. And I, I just never thought that that would be me. And I was also probably the person thinking, if I listen to my body, I, I'm literally just never going to stop eating. But that was coming from this place of always having rules. You know, one time someone in this field was explaining to me how that diet culture voice, that like eating disorder voice is almost like punishing you. And you're treating yourself as if you need to be in a timeout or you need to be told what to do. Like you're treating yourself like you don't trust yourself and you need these rules. I used to always be like, if someone just wrote out for me what to eat, when to eat, and that my body would be perfect when I'd be done, I could do it. Just tell me how, you know? But if you think about that, that's me being like, someone tell me everything because I don't trust my intuition. I don't trust myself. Yes. I don't have a relationship with myself, with food for me to even like figure it out. And so I think instead of the fear of I'd never stop eating, it's like, oh, I'm actually going to say, hey, little voice inside, I'll actually listen to you. And like yes. we can build a relationship and, and figure out what works for us. And now think about yourself. How often do you think about food? Never. And I have this debate with one of my friends because I have a friend who says you either eat to live or you live to eat. And she says to me, this was actually, I think, a big breakthrough. She said to me, you eat to live. And I said, that's not true. I said, I love food. I mm -hmm. said, I, I literally every morning am excited to eat. Like I will venture an hour out of the area to get a certain thing that I want if I can in that given day. Like I live to eat. And she was like, you don't because you, you know, because I seem to have this really healthy relationship with food. And I started to clarify that the difference is I love food, but I don't let food 
control my every move, my every thought, my every second. And you have so much more capacity to live your life and enjoy your life. And so to go back to your question, when we look at is intuitive eating health promoting, we have so many studies, 140 plus studies showing not only physical benefits, but mental and emotional benefits. One of those being increased life satisfaction. And it makes so much sense because think about before the old version of Victoria, you would sit down and and hyper focus on everything at a meal. Like, sure, you're physically present, but not mentally and emotionally present Mm -hmm. in, you know, in a scenario like that. And now you can go and be present with your friends and order what you want and enjoy the food in front of you. And more importantly, enjoy the experience around Mm -hmm. you. So there's that increased life satisfaction, but there's also, we have so much research showing, you know, improved metabolism, blood sugar, blood pressure, just all of these really great physical benefits as well. And it makes sense because then you, when we become intuitive eaters, we can listen to our body. We're not restricting, we're not binging. But I think people get really caught up in social media on just the all foods fit. So then they jump to that complete opposite side where I'm not going to be able to to control myself because they're only thinking of the binging that they're currently doing with those foods. Actually, I loved your video on Taco Bell. You were like, let's say you just said, I'll eat Taco Bell a week. You'll yeah. go, you'll eat it. And then eventually after after four days of a Crunchwrap Supreme for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I would bet my life savings that on Friday, you're going to be like, the last thing I want is Taco Bell. Yep. Absolutely. And then that's when you're going to say, "Mm, well, you know what might sound really good right now? A crunchy carrot or an apple, which brings me to misconceptions. If you're an intuitive eater, you never eat healthy. Yes. And oh, this is just, I think, like we just said, it's that fear of, but if I can eat all of the foods, I'm never going to stop eating them. And when we look at the the number one study on food habituation was with college kids and pizza. And they told them, like, you're going to come to this seminar, or this meeting every month, and you're going to get free pizza every night. And they're like, yes, free pizza. And then what happened by a few days in? Like, I never want to look at pizza again. Right. And we don't want to ruin foods for people. Right. But that's that's what happens with intuitive eating is you have this fear of these foods because of diet culture. We have this deep-seated fear that this is going to make me gain weight. And so we need to attack those fears head on and have exposure to foods that are scary. And the more you are exposed to them, the more they become just food. And I like to use the analogy, Evelyn Tribble used this once, of falling in love. So I want you to think about who said I love you first, you or Max? Max. And when he said it that first time, what was your experience like in your body? What were you feeling? Were you nervous? Were you sweating? Were you shaking? Like, was it a big deal or? Oh, yeah. So excited. He accidentally said it. And I was like, oh, you love me. And you're like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> and now look at you guys. And so now when he says, I love you, do you have that same experience in your body that you did the first time he said it? No, because we say it a hundred times Yeah, it's a like, day. love you, bye. You know, like, <laughs> love you, okay, bye. Love you, bye. Love you, bye. Italy, <laughs> so excited. <excel. laughs> so that's what we want to do with food in a sense where when you're dieting, it's like, oh my God, pizza. Oh my God, Cheetos. Like, it's like you're, you're having like a reaction to oh, these foods, mean. right? It's like, oh my God. Because it's forbidden. Yes. And then now it's like, oh, pizza. If I want it. Because like, I, okay. I could also have it tomorrow yes, if I wanted it. I can it. have it any day. Yeah. Oh, you're like, oh, Cheetos. Okay, yeah, I have them here, but like maybe I'll have them later. So it's that constant exposure to it. Not that we don't want pizza to be fun, right? Or to, to be amazing and enjoy it, but we want to neutralize it. And that's what we do with intuitive eating. So it won't always be just the fun foods and the play foods. But I do want to give people that expectation of when they start intuitive eating, there will be more of the fun foods and play foods because you have physically restricted them for so long and probably mentally restricted them as well, where that's that I shouldn't be eating this. Why am I eating this? I'm such a bad person. And I do want to bring that point up, too, because some people will say, Sammy, I don't physically restrict. I don't physically restrict. You're saying restriction leads to binging. Maybe you're hand to mouth eating the food. So you're not physically restricting. But are you mentally restricting and saying, I don't deserve this. I'm such a bad person for eating this. Because if there is mental restriction and negative self-talk towards your relationship with food, there will still be binging. Yeah. And I think that that's a great point. And actually something that my family will say to me a lot is I eat very nutritious. I mean, Mm -hmm. I like using the word nutritious because 
healthy, no matter how much work I do, it always sounds like it is demonizing anything other. I'm a nutrient dense girl. Yeah. Too. I'm I a, say nutrient dense. Yes, nutrient dense. Mm-hmm. I eat very nutrient dense foods. I love carrots. I love fruit. I love vegetables, Brussels sprouts, kale, sweet potatoes, salad. And my family will say to me that they think on my social media, it doesn't portray that I'm eating as wide range of foods as I am. Because Mm -hmm. typically, like, I think it's helpful for people to see that intuitive eating content through the lens of like arena food or fast food yep. because those are the foods not eaten. But I like the other day, Max and I got home from a trip and we had just been having lots of fun on this trip. And I literally was like, I really want sweet green. And it was because I know like I, that's just going to feel amazing in my body yeah. and super nutritious. And it's just going to, I'm going to sleep well and I'm just going to feel great and energized. And In a past mindset, I think the talk might have been, oh, my God, I ate all of this, quote, bad food. Mm -hmm. So now I have to have a salad because I've been a bad girl. And that sends me down a different spiral, whereas now I'm just like, I have no regrets about my weekend. It was fucking amazing. And you know what? A salad sounds bomb because I don't even remember the last time I had lettuce. Absolutely. And that's the self-talk. Yes. And recognizing that like we're not a better person for eating a salad just so we're not like a worse person for eating a donut because food has no morality but I think amen yes but I just think that there's so much fear and it's so understandable because I know you and I have both been there when you're in the dieting trenches you can't imagine a life where you would just order a salad because you wanted a salad. Mm -hmm. But let's go back to that food habituation. We use the example of the fun foods. Now let's swap it. When you're on a diet, we like the food habituation is the dieting food, the air quotes, healthy food. So when you're, when all you're eating is vegetables, lean chicken breast, right? Brown rice. It's like, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and it's that food habituation with those. So once you eat all of the foods and all foods are neutral, then you're going to be able to actually listen to what you want. But telling someone who's in the trenches of diet culture to listen to their body, they're like, I don't know what the fuck that means. Because they've never exercised that voice. Exactly. They've turned, it's so far down because the diet culture and the food police, as we call it in intuitive eating, is so loud that they can't hear that intuitive eater that's inside everybody. I also think what's interesting is a lot of people coming from diet culture have that kind of perfectionist mindset around food. And like I said before, if someone told me exactly what to do and when like you know we want so much control and we want perfection and I think for me coming to intuitive eating and healing my relationship with food you know it is realizing there are times where I don't listen to my body and it doesn't feel great I mean actually for my birthday a few weeks ago my brother and soon-to-be sister-in-law Cubby brought me in and out and they were like what do you want and I was like I want a double double I want fries you know I want a Sprite after eating the double double I don't know if I was just talking to them so I wasn't really paying attention to my fullness I just felt like so sick and so I don't know like I didn't really listen to my body in that moment and you know what that's fine because I'm not going to be a perfect intuitive eater and every meal is not going to be, I listen to my body a hundred percent correctly. And you know, that night, yeah, I'm sitting with some discomfort, but I'm not drawing on a master plan to fix it tomorrow. I'm just like, okay, interesting. This is good to know. This is knowledge I take with me. And you know, maybe the next time I check in halfway through my burger or I get two single patties and then I see, I don't know. My point is you have to give yourself the compassion that being a perfect intuitive eater, especially coming from lots of this trauma and disordered eating, like you're going to see a calorie on a menu and maybe choose the other thing and be like, why the fuck did I do that? I'm supposed to be not caring about calories, but you're human. Yes. (laughs) And I love that you brought up like you were feeling physical discomfort, but you were just a neutral observer in your body of like, huh, okay. And that's like, as an intuitive eater, that's what we practice over and over and over again is every eating experience is an opportunity to learn something. And I think in diet culture, when we feel physical discomfort, then we pair that with the mental discomfort. That's where the negative self-talk swoops in is like, how could you do this? You're such a bad person. And it's, we have to separate the physical discomfort and the mental and emotional discomfort. I want you to keep riffing on this. I literally wrote down morality when you said it before, because we truly live in a world that's like, if you are not eating like kale and brown rice instead of white rice, or Mm -hmm. 
I don't know, celery juice instead of pear juice. I mean, it's crazy how we've chosen these foods and decided that if you are literally a better person, if you eat them, and if someone's eating fast food, that they're a worse person. Yes. And so that that's closer to the top of the beginning of intuitive eating is we're looking at principle number three, making peace with food. So having that unconditional permission to eat and what is your relationship to these foods? So you can just take a piece of paper, cut it down the middle on one side, right? Good. On the other side, right? Bad. What foods come up for you in the good category? What come up for you in the bad category? Typically, if we're chronic dieters, that good side is all the veggies, right? Like you said, celery juice, all of these things. And the bad foods are going to be more of the play and fun foods, the pizza, the crackers, cake, all that stuff. So when I work with people, I'll ask them, are you a bad human being if you eat cake, pizza, cookies? And they're like, no, like it doesn't change my character, doesn't change my worth. Like they logically know that. But then we say, OK, do you feel guilt for eating these? And they'll say, well, yeah. And guilt is a moral emotion. So we should only feel guilty if we do something that breaks like our moral code. So that tells us right there that's a cognitive dissidence. That's saying my logic and my belief systems do not match. I don't believe I'm a bad person for eating cake but I feel guilty for eating cake. And so once we can identify that, then we can start to challenge that. And that's that's morality 101, like like knowing that we feel guilty for eating food that is that keeps us alive. That's what intuitive eating is all about, of finding that unconditional permission to eat food and believing that we're allowed to eat food. Something people probably then rebuttal, right? We go back to the, what do you call them? Something jabronis. I think I said gym, gym jabronis. jabronis. What even is or it? Jamoke. What, what like even a is jamoke it? is like a joke. What even is a jabroni? I don't know. I just think of like a bit, <laughs> like I think of all of the dudes up in my comment section when one of my calorie deficit videos went on the wrong side of TikTok. Yeah. And it was just all the dudes with their abs and their selfies. Yeah. and. Okay. Well, that brings me to kind of this next question that I was going to say is, There are people who will say, if you look at the books, you know, someone who does eat the things in the bad column, like, is literally going to die sooner or literally going to gain weight and then have these X, Y, Z problems. Like, you know, then we get into like the fat phobia. Can you riff on like health at every size and also why that thought process isn't 100 percent foolproof? Yes. So I think when someone says that, it just shows the lens that they're looking through. There's so much weight stigma. There's so much bias. A lot of times those kind of comments and those kind of things that people are saying, they think that weight equates to health. So a larger body is unhealthy and a smaller body is healthy. And we know that that is just simply not true. We can all think of a friend or a family member or somebody who resides in a smaller body and has maybe blood levels that are out of normal range or maybe a disease that they're struggling with, right? And we can all think of people that are in larger bodies. I have so many clients that are in larger bodies that have a clean bill of health. So if weight equated to health, then everybody that resided in a larger body would have every medical disease and condition and losing weight and being skinny or thin would be the cure to everything. But we know that that is not true. So I think there's just so much bias that is wrapped up in comments like that. And it's being able to unpack that, to recognize that. And going off into health at every size, I think I see so many comments of these jabronis, back to the, back to the word, where they're like, you think every sized human is healthy. That's not what health at every size is. Health at every size is delivering fair, unbiased health care to every sized human being. Basically, that every human, no matter their size, deserves respect and human decency. So when I sit down in front of a client, I don't look at them and make assumptions about any of their behaviors based on the size of their body. Mm -hmm. And that's where there's just such a misconception on social media that they think that it means like, oh, no matter what size body you are, you're just calling everybody healthy. That's not it at all. If we go down the health rabbit hole here and look at the social determinants of health, there are so many things that correlate to health and that impact our health. And we know that weight is under the genetics and the biology. That's where set point theory comes into play. We all have a predetermined blueprint that our 
body likes to be in a certain range. And sure, there are things that can affect it, such as medications, illnesses, medical diseases and conditions. But generally speaking, our body is going to stay in, in a certain range, no matter what we do. And so when we look at improving health, if someone says, I genuinely want to improve my health, then we're going to go look at the individual behaviors that contribute to health. That's things such as nutrient density and variety in our diet. Simply when I say diet, what we eat and drink, hydration status, sleep, stress management. These are all things, movement, that we can implement, that we can work on, that we can unpack, that will genuinely improve our health uncoupled from intentionally shrinking our body. We can work on all of those things and have better health outcomes, and we don't have to be focusing on shrinking our body. So helpful. And I just, even for me, I forget the clarifying definition of health at every size. Yes. So I even I appreciate you breaking that down because I think it's so true. Like thinking of some of these most asked questions, you know, people will ask if I'm an intuitive eater, will I gain weight or mm -hmm. will my body change? And they have the fear of, well, I like how my body looks now. And if I pursue intuitive eating, what if I don't like the set point when I figure out what it is? Yeah, that's a hard one to sit with. And to answer the question, very honestly, our bodies are always going to change. If you're a human being, which chances are if you're listening to this, you are. <laughs> Hello, the AI robots. You never know. That's you never scary. know. <laughs> but human beings, our bodies will always ebb and flow. They will always be changing. And so I like to say when you see like before and after pictures online, they're not before and after unless that person is dead, which I don't wish on anybody. That's not an after photo. That's a during photo. So all of these diet photos where people are showing transformation, that's before and during. Fully. So to come back to the question of set point, if you live your life thinking that if you just get smaller, that you're going to love yourself more, if you just get smaller, you're going to have all the love and acceptance in the world, that is just simply not true. And so... It comes back to kind of how we started the episode. What are your core beliefs about body size? What do you believe about yourself in a smaller body? And a lot of people have experienced this if you've ever weight cycled or, you know, yo-yo dieted and you see a picture of yourself when you were in a smaller body. I'll ask clients, what was your self-talk like then? Were you like, oh, girl, I'm good. Like, I'm happy. Or were you like, it's not good enough. I need to be smaller. Because if you weren't happy in that smaller body... What makes you think you're going to be happy when you get this next smaller body? Literally, I think I know the exact photo I think of when yeah, you say that. And I remember that beach day and thinking, you know, oh, I don't look good in this photo or this could be better. And then looking back, I'm like, I legitimately have a four pack. Like, I'm like, that's the most pack I've ever had in my life. <laughs> the most of a pack. I'm like, I'm not even going to say six. It was four. But... <laughs> I, I could not see it at the time. And I thought my legs, this, this, that. So it's so, it's so true. And speaking of set point, like I am a true size 10. I am a true size large. If you told me when I was 16, I would have said, no, I have to be a four. Mm -hmm. At max is six. I have to be a four, but at, at max is six. Like I'm not even an eight. I'm a 10. And also whenever I post my size, people will be like, you're a 10 or I also a size 30 jean, a hundred percent, a 29 if they are somewhat loose or fitting. Yeah. And those are numbers that like really don't bother me now, but it's crazy how I'll get like a swarm of DMs for like, oh my God, you got a large t-shirt. Like this means so much to me because I don't know. I'm in such a healed place that I don't, I'm like, whatever. It could be Your apple fruit banana tied to that. I know. I'm like, they should just change it to colors. Like I wear, I wear <laughs> well, purple. Like I wear, I wear apple. Like I'm so in favor of no, that. No, seriously. Cause it has such a, we've attached such a negative connotation. My point is like, is this the body that I would have been okay with at 16? No, but am I so happy and content with my relationship with food and the happiness I feel in my life? And the, the freedom I feel because I've become an intuitive eater. Yeah. And like you said, I don't miss that, that mindset that I was having to pursue to be a size my body didn't naturally want to be. Yes. And, and one of the things when we went going back to is intuitive eating health promoting, we have research that with intuitive eaters, you stay at a, a more in a neutral weight range where it's less weight fluctuation because your body's able to get back to the set point. So I think people are so tied into diet culture where your weight's going up and down and up and down and up and down. Eventually, a sign of intuitive eater is just stabilization in weight. And to bring it full circle to that just body image has everything to do 
with the brain and not the physical body. But diet culture tells us if you want to love yourself, shrink yourself. If you want to love yourself, be in a smaller body. But we know that that's not how it works. If you want to love yourself, you need to speak kindly to yourself because you can't hate your way to happiness. Oh, that's so powerful. If you had a client call you up and was like, Sammy, I've been doing good on intuitive eating, but I just broke down crying today because I don't like my body. Like, what do you say? Yeah, I think this comes back to just sit with them in it. I think as a recovering people pleaser, I always want to fix everything. And becoming an intuitive eating counselor, I realized there is so much power. And when someone says, I don't like my body right now to say that really sucks. Like, tell me more about it. And I'm here with you in this. And to know that it will not feel like that always. We're going to go through surges. It's like a a wave. You just got to ride it out. And to know that it's okay to not like your body in that moment, but it will not be that way forever. And we, we talked a little bit off air about this and to bring this back into the conversation as well. So many people think they can't start intuitive eating until they don't want to lose weight anymore. Right. I have friends who are like, I just let me lose 10, 20 pounds and then I'll start. Just let me get there. (laughs) And then, yeah, let me me, meet my magical weight and then I'll start. So I, I always like to talk about the difference between the desire of losing weight and the pursuit of intentional weight loss. And most people, if they have dieted for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, which are like every client we work with, there's always going to be that little seed inside of you that's like, but maybe I should lose weight or I really want to lose weight. Or I saw a picture of myself when I was smaller. Now that triggered me and I want to be in a smaller body. The desire for weight loss, if you've dieted for 20 years, that is not, I never expect someone to learn about intuitive eating and be like, oh, great. I don't want to lose weight anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that just doesn't work that way. So it is okay to desire weight loss. It's actually really important to bring that up to your intuitive eating counselor to talk about why you're feeling that way. But that is different than the pursuit of intentional weight loss, meaning engaging in harming or self-harming behaviors of extreme restriction, over-exercising, doing things that are going to be detrimental to your health. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a state of I'm really interested in intuitive eating, but there's still a part of me that wants to lose weight. I would like to encourage your listeners, you can still start intuitive eating journey because a big part of the intuitive eating journey is unpacking weight science, set point theory, and why you want to lose weight. Because when someone says, I want to lose weight, I don't shame them and say, no, you shouldn't do that. I say, tell me why. Why do we want to lose weight? Keep asking yourself why, like that little kid, why, why, right. and why? Then, and then I think they just then bring themselves full circle in the realization to what you just said of it's not going to bring the happiness or the answer. I think that's huge also for intuitive eating. For me, healing as an emotional eater is like that thing that I'm craving, whether it is comfort or love or a warm hug or attention, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get it through food. Yes. No matter what I eat, I, I will still feel like I'm desiring this emotion or this fix for this emotion that food's not going to give me. Yes. And that goes back to the intuitive eating principle, coping with our emotions with kindness. What are you feeling? What do you need? If you have been fed, physical hunger is not in this situation. When we turn to food to cope, it doesn't make us a bad person. It makes us a human being. There is so much emotional tie to food. And I find so many people are afraid to walk away from dieting because it's a coping mechanism. It's this false sense of control that when all of this shit out here is out of control, which we are living in a crazy world right now, well, I can turn to dieting. I can count my calories and follow my meal plan and eat my portions and do all this. Or in your case, I can get lost in food. Mm -hmm. And, And both of those, whether it's an extreme restriction or extreme binging or both or however it presents, those become coping mechanisms. So it is really important to get professional support because if you take that away... That's a coping mechanism that has served you. It doesn't make you a bad person. And so if we just take away dieting, that's really, really hard. Yeah. And I still have, you know, moments where I have the awareness of, okay, I'm about to be emotionally eating because of it's not a binge, but it's like, yeah, I'm not hungry. But you know what? I really want this because of Max is eating it and it looks good or because it sounds good or because 
it I just want it, you know, because whatever I want it. Whatever and then, reason. And I and I eat it. But the awareness and then no guilt after the fact is yes. what prevents this a binge cycle. Yes. And there might be other times that you're in that situation where you're like, yeah, I can have it, but I don't want it. Mm-hmm. But knowing that, hey, if I see food and I want to eat it just because and I'm not hungry, that's not emotional eating. It could be boredom if that's the emotion that's coming up for you. But if we are emotionally eating, if we're, let's say, feeling sadness or grief or, you know, you just broke up with a partner and you're finding yourself eating Ben and Jerry's, like that is a coping mechanism. I, yeah, totally. Right? Like that's <laughs> not a bad thing. Right. We And so that's where with intuitive eating, it's building coping mechanisms in addition to food. It's not instead of food. It's in addition because food is, if we have food security, it's a very easy, accessible coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. And so many clients that I supported through COVID and our team supported through COVID, food was such an important coping mechanism for people because they couldn't leave their house. They didn't have other coping skills. And so it's it's building a toolbox in addition to food. We also are in summer, the beginning of oh, summer. Yeah. It's here. And that brings up a lot, no matter how far along this journey people are, to be in bathing suits. Am I wearing a bikini? Am I wearing a one piece? Am I going to put one on at all? Who are the other people there? And I'm going to compare myself to them. Or honestly, just like going on trips and like sharing clothes. I'm going on a bachelorette. There's an Excel spreadsheet. Everyone puts their size down. Like, oh which goodness. fine, I'll put mine down, but I, I don't care. But I remember, I remember a time where I might have been like, oh, I can't be the only large in the column. Oh, for I thought you were meaning like, Everybody was putting their their clothes their in, weight. like or just like <laughs> of what are we packing so we can share? But do you mean for like a shirt for like yeah, a I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like these bachelorette parties everyone, are just very. We have to weigh <laughs> all of you. On, we're, we're, everyone, there's a weigh in every morning. No I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! But yeah, so I mean, have you had clients kind of raise this concern to you? Yes, and I feel like if if your listeners haven't already, they need to go back and listen to the episode you just did with, is it Alicia McCarvel? Yeah. Oh my God. I just listened to it on the plane right here. I was crying. She's like amazing. Thanks for listening. And obviously you are too. She has a very healing story about that will make you want to run on the bikini naked. Right? No, when she was talking, I was like, I better never have a fucking thought about my body again. (laughs) So I loved her story because like, okay, first we need to listen to her story and just her perspective from being in a larger body and her experience. It's she's her, that entire episode was like, wear the damn suit, go to the beach, mm-hmm. have the experiences, have the memories. We just did an episode on the Find Food Freedom podcast where it's entitled How to Feel Comfortable in a Bathing Suit. And this is there's 40 minutes of tips and tricks where I talk about it. But the biggest thing I can say is just like our clothes in our closet, we need to feel actually comfortable in this suit. We can't get a suit that's like digging into our bikini line and it's like the only thing we can think about Mm -hmm. or, you know. So finding a bathing suit that you feel physically comfortable in. And I always bring it back from a mental emotional side of what do you want to feel and experience on the beach? We're going to use Alicia's story as an example. She said her and her husband played in the waves or her partner for two hours and she like was crying because it was this beautiful experience and they had so much fun. That's what we need to focus on. What do you want to feel and experience when you're going to the pool with your family or your friends or you're going to the beach? That's what we want to center. And then everything comes around that. Okay, in order to feel and experience joy or being present with my loved ones, I need a comfortable bathing suit. I maybe want to pack a fun cover up that because cover ups are the best. They're like flowy. They're not tight. They're super cute. So get some things you're excited to put on your body. That's going to help. And make sure when you're coming to the beach that you have snacks, that you're hydrated, that you're fed. If you're sitting there like hangry as fuck, how are you going to enjoy the beach? No, seriously. When I even get a shred of hangry in me, I'm like, how did I ever do this? How did yes. I ever like restrict? <laughs> how am I going to enjoy being present when all I can think about is food? So <laughs> one of my favorite memes that my friend and I send each other is like, it's like Ursula from Little Mermaid. And she's like on a couch under the water. And she's like, I missed my snack and I'm <laughs> wasting away to nothing. And I'm like, that's me. <laughs> yes. So like we need to nourish ourselves. And and I, like I said, just coming back to your intention. Why Why are you showing up to the beach or the pool? What do you want to feel and experience? And when that is top of mind, then when the negative thoughts come in, we don't judge them. We recognize them. We let them go and we come back to what we want to feel and experience. Absolutely beautiful. Do you have any fun summer plans? 
Ooh, mom is going to Penn State in a few weekends with my college friends. Oh, like fun. all the kids are gone. We just frolic around campus and live in pure nostalgia. <laughs> and then my husband and I are going to Maine for a little mommy and daddy getaway trip. Oh, I love that. That is so great. Yay. Oh, my God. Well, I can't wait to see the pics. And Sammy, thank you for everything today. This was just wonderful. Knowledge bombs as always. I so appreciate you flying to LA to be in studio with me. It was an honor. And yeah, I'm going to have to certainly like re-listen to this again and take notes a second time. (laughs) And just know too, first of all, thank you so much. So happy to be here. I will always fly to LA for you. Great excuse to get out of the house. And for any listeners, we have a lot of free resources at Find Food Freedom. So I always like to just point that out. If they go to findfoodfreedomresources.com, we have free trainings that walk in depth through intuitive eating. So if they're like, hey, I'm more of a beginner, I need to to find more resources, so much there at findfoodfreedomresources.com. Yeah, definitely everyone. Like if I had to trust anyone in this world with this, it would be sending them to Find Food Freedom. And just congratulations on everything you build. I mean, it's like an insane empire. That's not easy. Win for you and it's amazing. So congrats. Thank you, Beck. I don't know how you do that all. <laughs> well, I don't know how you do it all. I see you flying all over the world working with this brand and this I brand. Know. So right back how, at you. I don't know how anyone does anything. Yeah, we're just, <laughs> Hey, we're all just taking it one day at a time. Well, everyone will love this. We are going to go get some tacos and chips and salsa and guac. So bye. Bye. (laughs) Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Real Pod. If this hit home or helped you in some way, send it to a friend, a teammate, roomie, share the love, share the realness. New episodes of Real Pod come out every single Wednesday. So make sure you are subscribed to this podcast so you never miss an episode. 